So it's not uncommon for investors to want to diversify their portfolio, and a lot of people like to consider Airbnbs. We're going to talk about that and more on today's episode. Let's get ready to scale. Hey guys, my name is Jeanette Friedrich, Director of Investor Relations at Blue Lake Capital. Joining me today is Jacob Mueller. Jacob is the co-founder of Rinjoy, a short-term rental, vacation rental, and Airbnb rental management firm. He has grown Rinjoy from $0 in revenue to over $4 million in less than three years. He previously held positions as a regional manager at Atlas Real Estate, was a commercial real estate broker, and a social media and go-to market product manager. He has a BA in economics from Hillsdale College, and he's joining us today from Colorado Springs. So, Jacob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, no, very excited to talk to you. You have a very eclectic and interesting background that I'm sure has served you really well in establishing Rinjoy. So I'm curious to know what was the inspiration, you know, behind Rinjoy and even more interestingly, what go-to market strategy did you implement? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, honestly, it's pretty simple. I was a real estate investor through my time as a commercial real estate broker. I was a leasing agent, nothing glamorous. I was the guy doing the 400 cold calls a day. I uh, learned a lot, though, and then transitioned into investment real estate at Atlas. Learned a lot from that team. They're a really phenomenal team now. Uh, I think when I joined, they had probably about 3,000 or 4,000 units under management, long-term rentals, and now I believe they're north of 12,000. Um, so they've grown quite wow. large, and uh, I was part of that growth. I learned a ton. But during my time at Atlas, I learned how to invest in real estate myself. And so I started buying a lot of real estate assets, long-term rentals, short-term rentals, commercial real estate, value add, and turnkey. I, bought, I kind of bought and learned it all. And through that process, I ended up acquiring, or I ended up with, I think, six or seven properties that were Airbnbs. And at, at one point in time, once I kind of had that seventh one, I had been running them for a little while, and I started thinking a little bit more long-term. I realized this is a lot of work. And uh, I want to hire somebody to manage these for me because this is not really where I want to spend my time. Ironically enough, I went to market to find a property manager for my Airbnbs and could not find one. Not couldn't find one that said they would serve my needs, but did it at the level that I was expecting to operate my properties. And so as a result, I kind of the little entrepreneur in me kind of observed, hey, there's an opportunity here to actually enter into this market as a professional manager. And so that's how uh, that's how Renjoy came to be. Very interesting. Very interesting. And so, you know, back to your go to market strategy, how did you decide to, you know, put together the the brand of the company? Uh, how mm. did you you know, position yourself for a successful launch? Uh, you know, what was your thought process behind that? Or was it more of like an organic? Oh, it's just happening, you know, type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, to be honest, I am one of those people who kind of just, uh, you know, it's like ready, fire, aim kind of people. Uh, but but in this case, there was actually some some planning and some intention behind it. I'm sure many of your listeners are very familiar with the concept of starting with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. And so when I had decided after looking at the marketplace and not finding a short-term rental property manager I trusted with my assets, with the wealth that I had created, uh, I decided to to really think through what does this mean for me? Because it's not just... It's like literally the exact opposite. I was trying to take this off my plate. And now I'm thinking about, no, no, bringing it all onto my plate. <laughs> and so I started really thinking about why would I want to do that? And what's in line with kind of my personal mission in life? And what am I trying to do with all of these, these eclectic stages that I've kind of made that you mentioned earlier? And so we decided, I got with a couple of my partners who I learned a lot from. Um, they were actually clients of mine as a real estate broker. I had helped them acquire quite a few properties. And uh we, I learned a lot from them. They learned a lot from me. And we decided to go after this thing. And we decided to start with the long-term vision. What's our goal here? And our goal was to serve people like us because we observed there wasn't anybody out there. We want somebody who cares about operational efficiency, who cares about actually putting dollars back in our owner's pockets. Because as I'm sure many of your listeners know, oftentimes it's the hardest part about sending money out is getting money to come back in. You can, you can have your paper gains all day long, but until you actually have cash coming back into your bank account, it can feel really, really challenging. So we set out to have two goals with our company. 
We wanted to serve at least a thousand owners and we wanted to distribute over $200 million back to their pockets directly. And that comes through operating their properties efficiently. Um, and there's obviously two sides of that. You have to maximize your revenue and you all have to minimize your expenses without deferring maintenance. Mm -hmm. And so our go-to-market was very simple. It was serve people like us because there's nobody out here doing this. And I happen to already have a pretty big network from all of my real estate activities because uh, as you know, from my years of being a broker, I happened to be pretty successful. And so I had a really strong network and it was as simple as this is the kind of company we want to be. We want to serve investors. We want to be this big. Now let's work back from there. And how do we do that? Okay. My network is big enough for us to go to market today to get that critical mass so we can drive some operational efficiency efficiencies in one main market, which is Colorado Springs, that we can then use to lever up and grow into other markets um, to help our help our owners kind of diversify where their real estate holdings are located. So we're kind of in that second stage now where uh, more than half of our properties under management are in Colorado Springs, but now we're expanding into other markets. Very interesting. Now, I'm curious to know, what were some surprising challenges that you discovered along the way that you didn't anticipate and how did you address them? Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many. When you grow that fast, I mean, you mentioned zero to, to four million in a few years. Just to clarify for some of your more savvy listeners, that's not collections that we received on behalf of owners. That's actually our revenue. Our mm -hmm. collections this year will be north of twelve million. And so, one of the biggest challenges that I that I completely underestimated was actually accounting and finance and tracking because short term rentals have way more transaction volume than long term rentals do. And we obviously employ trust accounting because we're a licensed real estate brokerage. Your property managers had better be employing trust accounting. I, it's shocking that we have to say this, but, um, and so as a result, because of the transaction volume, it's just incredibly difficult to be rigorous with your financial accounting. And that challenge is still, you know, we're getting much better at it than, than we were early on, but early on, Man, we were trying consultant after consultant, third party accounting firm after third party accounting firm, and nobody could really keep up with what we needed. So we ended up bringing it in house mm -hmm. and building a whole team around it. So right now, our finance team consists of, I believe, five or six full time people. Wow. Yeah, for sure. I, I could definitely appreciate that challenge. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about too is, you know, for some of our listeners, they may very well have their own Airbnb that they manage mm -hmm. or, you know, longer term rentals. Um, but, you know, and you, you touched on it right at the beginning, you know, you started the company because you couldn't find the property managers that you wanted. Right. And so now when you're hiring internally, you know, and adding to your own team, I mean, not all, not all property managers are created equal and mm -hmm. you know, they, they can be great, but they can be great with one particular strategy and maybe not with another strategy. And so I'm just curious, you know, what have you done to try to optimize, uh, your own development in management and the, that of those that you hire? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think in order to answer it well, I kind of actually have to take us on a little little side tour here for a second, just to understand some of the key differences between short-term rental property management and mm -hmm. long-term rental property management, because they are, they're similar, but they're not the same. Right. The easiest way I can explain it is there's this Venn diagram, right? You've got three circles, Okay. One of those circles is short-term rental tenant acquisition. Another one of those circles is long-term rental tenant acquisition. And then the third circle is property care. This mm -hmm. is maintenance, cleaning, upkeep, you know, all your CapEx, all of that stuff is in that third circle. A lot of people, because they see this relationship in this Venn diagram, think, oh, if I already have a successful long-term property management business, all I have to do is add the short-term rental acquisition and then I'm good to go. But the challenge is, the short-term rental acquisition is actually extremely nuanced and difficult uh, because you're competing with a lot of other short-term rental availability out there. And it's not as simple as posting a listing and getting tenants. Mm -hmm. It's very, very different. And so in order to actually address your question of, hey, how, what do I look for you know, in a property manager? What, what kind of makes that different? You really have to uh, understand the operational differences between long-term rentals and short-term rentals. While the property care is the same, the acquisition of tenants is extremely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And I'm curious, how do you, sorry, I'm just like all over the place here, but it's very interesting to me. How do you optimize finding those short-term tenants in an mm -hmm. unbelievably competitive market 
um, you know, with, with so many different options out there for people to pick from, uh, you know, I can't, it, it's, it's gotta be very challenging. It's, I think it's easier with the freestanding large, you know, established mm. apartment complex, right. Than it is with, you know, one random, you know, short-term rental somewhere. So how do you do, how do you address those challenges? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are kind of two main strategies or schools of thought with the short term, uh, within the short term rental operations sphere of acquiring those tenants. One is to be single platform, be on one marketing platform like Airbnb. That's only one platform. We call that an OTA or an online travel agency. So you can be a single platform and just be really, really laser focused on acquiring those guests and how that platform is is posting your listings and what they like to see your listings have in order to drive guest traffic. Or you can take the other approach, which is be multi-channel, be on a lot of different platforms, acquire guests or short-term rental tenants from a variety of places. And the way that we have taken the latter because of the concentration risk, if you're on a single platform mm -hmm. and the way you do it, there's a, there's a couple of nuances to it. First, your pricing has to be spot on. If some of your listeners are kind of in the hospitality industry, they own hotels or other similar assets, they'll understand that pricing is actually extremely complex and dynamic. Mm -hmm. And one of the big advantages a manager has, like us with a lot of listings, is our pricing strategies are far more sophisticated than your normal you know, mom and pop who's just kind of listed their house on Airbnb. And so having that kind of pricing analysis and pricing pacing analysis saying, Hey, every, every day the market changes. You can't just say, Hey, this is my pricing algorithm for the year. And we're just going to use it year after year. That's not how it works. The market changes. It's very dynamic. And so we have a whole team of people who are constantly reviewing pricing. So that's one key way you acquire guests. And then the other is to understand the relationship between these travel agencies and their demographics. Who is on VRBO dot you know, and booking vacation rentals, who is on Airbnb and booking vacation rentals, who's on booking.com, who's on Google vacation homes and understanding your demographics within each particular booking channel. So you can optimize how you go to market on that channel in order to most speak to that most, the largest demographic on that channel. And by having that understanding, that analysis, we are, we are catering and marketing to the right person in the right place. Very interesting. I didn't even know there was a Google Vacations home. Wow. Oh, yeah. Good to mm -hmm. know. I'll have to check that out the next time instead of my my handy dandy Airbnb app. Yeah, it's just like Google Flights. I think it's another one of their add-ons, very similar to Google Vacation Homes. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. Well, you know, I also want to talk a little bit about the drama, right? And some of the challenges that can be associated with short-term rentals. Uh, rather, we're talking about regulations um, mm. or even how they, the whole NIMBY thing, you know, how they are viewed by certain communities. But before we get into that, let's have a word from our sponsor. Ready to Scale is brought to you by Blue Lake Capital, where we hunt down the best multifamily investment opportunities that we can find and invite investors to join in with us. We target Class B value-add multifamily properties across the Sunbelt. Our CEO, Ellie Perlman, invests a substantial amount of capital into every deal. This means our interests are aligned with yours. If you're an accredited investor looking to expand your portfolio and diversify sponsors, be sure to visit us at bluelake-capital.com. Blue Lake Capital, be bold, be extraordinary, and keep moving forward. All right, so Jacob, break it down for me. What do you think are some of the the unfair negative associations or stigmas that, you know, get stuck to owners of short-term uh, rental properties that really are just misunderstood. Yeah. I mean, I think there's this common conception that Airbnbs have a lot to do with housing affordability, which is not the case. Anybody in this industry uh, knows that, you know, short-term rentals are less than 1% of the total housing stock and therefore are a very, very small part, if any, of, of housing affordability. But lots of people don't, don't necessarily know that. The other consideration is I actually think a lot of people have valid concerns with having short-term rentals in their, in their neighborhoods, in their marketplaces. I actually think there's a lot of validity to that. Um, and I, I honestly have been really impressed with how one of our, our main market, Colorado Springs, has really approached this, where they put kind of a, a geographic spacing limit on how many short-term rentals can be within a certain area. 
And that really prevents one of the main concerns of hollowing out of neighborhoods from ever happening. Mm. Basically, the way it works is in our market, one you know short-term rental cannot be within 500 feet of another one. And so that that prevents kind of this crowding out or 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 this hollowing out of a neighborhood and really spaces them out and makes it so that you don't feel like you're living in, in a vacation market. Um, but, you know, honestly, I think that there's a lot of ways to do it well. And then there's lots of ways to do it poorly. I think anytime you swing fully onto one side of that spectrum where there's like no short term rentals allowed at all, I think that's a poor response from a municipal level. They're missing out on a lot of benefits that come with having vacation homes kind of throughout your city. There's a lot of benefits that come with that, actually. Um, and then if you go swing all the way to the other side, anybody can do anything they want. You can end up with these neighborhoods that get hollowed out and there's like no families living in those neighborhoods anymore. Um, or maybe one family and then the rest are Airbnbs. And it can really um, can be really negative in terms of the total overall cultural feel of, of a municipality of a city. Yeah. So I think there's valid aspects. I think that there are ways to do it well. Uh, and I always encourage people who are considering getting into this asset class to make sure you go into a market that already has rules and regulations in place and be very wary of going into a market that currently has no rules or regulations in place. Yeah, absolutely. That makes me also, you know, think about um, the predicament that people might find themselves in sometimes if they do you know, have a, a, a secondary or third property, you know, that they're utilizing as a short-term rental. And then all of a sudden, you know, someone comes in, lines are drawn and, you know, there goes your business plan. Uh, have you had any clients in that position and, and how did you help them or what do you recommend that they, people in a situation like that could do? Yeah, great question. The only situation we've had that happen in with a client was actually through an HOA, not through a municipality. And unfortunately, there was very little they could do. They had very little power over that HOA. And so we moved them to a monthly furnished model where you had guests staying for 30 plus days. You still get above market premiums from a long-term rental. You know, Usually you're going to get about a 30% premium on, on your rent, a long-term rental rate. So it can still be lucrative, uh, but it's not necessarily the, the target for this client. They are currently just operating it as a monthly furnished rental. Now, I will also add there are situations where you can have rules and regulations in place and the municipality decides to change it. This is actually happening in one of our main markets in Woodland Park, which is just outside of Colorado Springs. The city had granted short-term rental permits, had rules around it, was taxing them. And then after about two years of having those permits in place, they said, nope, we're not going to do it anymore. We're eliminating all short-term rentals and we're not going to renew any licenses. And so the city of Woodland Park is actually uh, in a lawsuit right now from from the short term rental Teller County short term rental alliance, which is kind of uh, an interesting court case. And I've learned not one of the only ones uh, that's currently working its way through the courts. I suspect we're going to see some interesting rulings coming down from federal courts about this very issue. Um, and I don't know what that will be, but it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, very interesting indeed. All right. Well, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I know for a matter of fact, actually, because I was just at dinner last night with some of our investors and one of the investors I was speaking to, uh, she has an Airbnb uh, that she just recently, you know, bought and is, is managing from afar. And so, you know, for investors in the similar situation that are either trying to find the right property management group, you know, to help them with these types of investments or, you know, doing it themselves, but definitely not wanting to have to keep doing it themselves. What mm -hmm. advice do you give to folks like that? Man, there, it's everybody's going to be really different on what they need and what to look for. I, I'll try to put it into some kind of high level level areas. One thing I always really encourage people to look for is a manager who owns their own Airbnbs, owns their own short-term rentals. It's definitely a manager who's going to understand a lot of your considerations and what you care about. And then the other thing is like, you really have to assess your goal. Is it an investment property or is it your second home? And if it's your second home, then your priorities might be a little bit different than this is purely an investment property and I'm just trying to maximize my return. And so that's a really important consideration with who you choose to hire. A um, couple of key questions to always ask, hey, how, how many properties do you manage in this area? It's really important that an operator, a property manager has density, which mm -hmm. is they manage a lot of properties in one place. Um, and then how many do you have here? How many do you plan to have? Understanding their growth 
plans is also actually really important because a lot of the pain that property owners will feel from their property manager are oftentimes because a property manager is either growing in that market or growing in another market and takes their eye off the ball or has to go through some you know, big challenging transitions within their business model that negatively affects you as the homeowner. So that's a key question. And then obviously, how do they approach guest acquisition? How do they approach damages? How do they approach housekeeping? There's like all the kind of the nitty gritty details that you're going to definitely want to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Now I have to ask a fun question too, which is, you know, do you have any good, as they say in Spanish, chisme, which is gossip, you know, do you have a, do you have any interesting, crazy story about, you know, any, any particular tenant in the past? Oh my gosh. Uh, we have many stories about our guests. I mean, at this point, we've probably hosted, I don't know, over 45,000 stays across our portfolio. And there's, you know, like, there's so many to choose from. And I don't, I, I'm always careful about uh, kind of pulling out these negative experiences because they don't necessarily give you a good sense of the reality, right? So mm -hmm. if I tell you, for instance, you know, we had a guest steal some arcade games from one of our properties. They literally like big, you know, like, bar size arcade games. Yeah. They just wow. brought in a dolly and rolled them out. It was pretty <laughs> wild to watch because we have it on security camera. Uh, so were you able to get them to back? Watch. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, no. Uh, but, <laughs> but uh, there's definitely a police report tied to them and there, there's a warrant out for their arrest. Uh, we are able, we have insurance. And so it's, you know, it's covered by how we approach these kinds of claims, but we have stuff like that, you know, not very often, but I guess, uh, you want, I guess a really simple thing always applies. Trust, but verify. Guests mm -hmm. will tell you all kinds of things, but uh, you need to verify whatever it is that they're saying. They uh, they often are not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be very diligent to ensure that you're looking out for your owners. This kind of actually goes back to like way back to the very beginning of this conversation where I, I mentioned that we built our management business for owners. And so a great example of this is if you go onto a, our uh, our Google business profile, you look up Renjoy on Google Maps or whatever, and you pull up our business, you're going to see a handful of one-star Google reviews. And you'll notice a theme about all of them. Every single one of them is from a guest who we held accountable for damages that happened during their stay. And they're wow. complaining and saying it wasn't them and all these other things. And we actually use that to illustrate what kind of management company we are, because some management companies are very guest focused. Hey, we had the guest has an amazing experience. The guest is always right. All this kind of stuff. We're like, absolutely not. We're here to make our owners as much money as possible while treating people fairly and ethically. Of course, we do intend to have very good guest experiences, which you'll see, but we very much side with our owners in protecting their assets. Yeah, no, very interesting. I, if it makes you feel better, we also have had incidences in the past where tenants have moved out with the appliances and all, uh, you know, yep. in the middle of the night. So it, it's, you know, you're not alone. We, we, we've known that pain too. Um, now I'm curious, how do you conduct this due diligence on the guest? If somebody's trying to do this mm. you know, on their own, what advice can you give them for being able to conduct that type of due diligence? Because it's pretty tough. Yeah. If you are an owner operator and you're running your own Airbnb, I would not recommend being multi-channel. I, I, I would be on Airbnb alone and I wouldn't bother maybe VRBO, but I would probably just be on Airbnb and I wouldn't bother with these other channels. And the reason for that is because Airbnb does have some host protection plans in place that are pretty valuable. And Airbnb also does a fair amount of, um, guest verification, all kinds of uh, processes behind that to ensure there's a real person, to ensure that there's accountability for that person. And a lot of the other travel agencies don't do that. And so if I was in those shoes, I would just be on Airbnb. Interesting. Good insight. Good insight. All right. Well, one last question for you before we move to what I call the lightning round questions. Um, I'm just curious to know how you are approaching scaling, you know, the company mm. even further, especially at a time that, you know, either rather it's through your own direct acquisitions or, you know, others that are looking to, to get into this space, you know, uh, uh, you know, housing is limited, you know, housing mm -hmm. is priced high, interest rates are still high. I mean, you know, yes, woohoo, the Fed, you know, did come down an, another, you know, uh, 25 basis points yesterday, but, you know, um, you know, how are, how are you addressing and approaching scaling your business and not letting these mm -hmm. types of challenges slow you down? 
Yeah, it's a good question. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ways to to approach this. I'm sure your listeners will also appreciate that you know the role of the entrepreneur, the business owner, is to constantly allocate and reallocate resources on that journey of growth. And so what I say today may be very different than what I say in six months or in three months even Mm -hmm. on how we allocate resources for growth. Um, But you said a couple of things and I I realized you asked me a question earlier that I did not address uh, directly, which was, hey, how do you find property managers given that it's very different between long-term and short-term rentals? And it's related to the growth question. Um, Short-term rental managers should not be set up similar to a long-term rental property manager from an org chart perspective, in my opinion. We don't have property managers, just to be clear. We do not have any. We are we are much more of a traditional business org chart setup. And we did that because we did want to scale. And if you think about the traditional property manager model, that's a very linear kind of a growth trajectory, right? Mm-hmm. One property manager can have, in short-term rentals, can have like 40 properties. Yeah. In long-term rentals, one property manager can have like 100 doors or maybe a little bit more. You can push it. But that's very linear, right? You have to hire a property manager for every 100 doors you have. Yeah, And we uh, we saw a lot of issues with kind of that as a business model. And so our company is structured uh, very differently where we actually have departments and um, we have cross responsibility with with different stakeholders, right? Guests are one kind of stakeholder and then owners are kind of another stakeholder. And then properties are kind of their own stakeholder if you think about a house as a person. Um, so as far as growth goes, marketplace, we are seeing a lot of challenges interest rates make it very difficult to produce, you know, attractive yield, even it, like in Colorado in particular, I would say I haven't seen a deal that makes sense probably in six months. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I'm reviewing, I don't review a ton of deals, but I see a handful of deals a week and I haven't seen anything that looks interesting here. Um, another market that's really kind of that we were going really hard on was Florida, but because of these hurricanes and the reinsurance having yeah. issues, we're kind of on pause there. I still think there's going to be a lot of opportunity in Florida, to be clear, but I very much am on pause and kind of waiting to advise or move client money down there um, and just kind of wait and see what ends up happening. The condos down there are kind of a mess with their new regulations. Um, so that's a really intriguing market too, I think, because of the disruptions. Um, but overall, it's hard. I mean, it's hard to find yield. Uh, I think, again, the safest and best way to make money in real estate to create wealth is to do value add. I mean, you just you just can't beat it. And so yeah. I would always encourage your listeners, if you are still looking to place capital and you have the capacity, do value add. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We're big, big fans of, of value add. That's our go-to strategy. Um, all, awesome. All right. Well, very insightful. Uh, before I let you go, I want to just ask you what we call our lightning round questions, which are five questions that I ask all of our guests. So are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So I'm going to, I guess, I have a guess as to what you're going to say, but I'm going to not, you know, stereotype you. So what do you do for fun when you're not doing real estate things? And given that you live in Colorado, I'm guessing it might have something to do with snow. Yeah, you know, I do love skiing, but that is not my primary passion, actually. Uh, uh, My wife and I are big trail runners. Oh, nice. Very cool. All right. Great. Now, what is something interesting about you that most people don't know? Something interesting about me that most people don't know. Uh, I have a spot. See this white spot here? Yeah. So this, people ask me if I dye this or bleach this, but that's not the case. I got that when I was like 20... I was like 21 or 22 years old. I had just graduated college. I graduated a year early because I had started this little digital marketing business. And we were probably three months in. I was living in this really crappy apartment. And we were just at the startup. We were grinding. We were grinding. And uh, we had like one big contract land. And then we were working on our next few deals. And But then we ran out of money, basically. Mm-hmm. And I had to decide whether I was going to pay rent or buy groceries. Um, and I had this situation like every, each month, like probably three or four months in a row. Mm. And during that period of my, of my life, this spot appeared. I don't remember exactly when or how, but because of the stress during that time, I just had this white spot appear on my, on my hair. It's not a birthmark or anything like that, but stress is real. And uh, yeah, it can, it can affect you in pretty wild ways. So that's something people don't know about me. 
Wow. Yeah, no, very interesting. And and stress is indeed very real. I'm glad that times are much better now than uh, than they were back then. Um, all right. What about uh, as far as a book or a podcast that you would recommend to people if, you know, they want to learn more about, you know, what you're doing or about how to leverage, you know, these types of investment strategies? What what advice do you have there? I'm going to do two. I'm going to do a podcast that's a little more generic and then a book that's more specific. My podcast recommendation is the All In podcast. I'm mm -hmm. sure many of your listeners are familiar. Uh, I find that their insights and the way that they think about problems is actually really, really helpful for me um, in understanding you know, what's going on and how to think about, about business. I learn a lot from that podcast every episode. Um, and then for a book, I just finished, actually, I just got back from Costa Rica and I read this book on the beach. It was awesome. And it's called Unreasonable Hospitality. And it's a really, really great book for anybody who wants to consider, you know, having short-term rentals because it's not necessarily the approach that I take directly, but it was a really fascinating read, very enjoyable. And uh, I think actually pretty much anybody can learn from that book and I would recommend it no matter what business you're in. Very cool. I'm a huge fan of the All In podcast myself. I have a, a long commute uh, here in California. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they keep me company each week. Yeah, for sure. And I really enjoyed the diversity of their opinions and perspectives, mm -hmm. too. I find their discussions to be really very high quality. It's a great podcast. So, I would definitely agree with you on that. Um, all right. Now, one of the things that we also talk about on the show, which you and your white spot will appreciate, I think, is that, you know, yes, we all want to make money. Yeah, we want to have some great returns and good investments, but it's not about that. It's really about being able to build and live extraordinary lives. And so what is your advice to people that are focused on building those types of lives? I mean, I'll, I'll go back to something that I always kind of wish I had known earlier, and it's related to this. How do you become extraordinary or how do you have a really big impact, which I think is related to your question. And for me, it is, you know, constant self-improvement and something I wish I had learned when I was younger and I'm still learning now is how do I make that faster? Like the feedback cycle of noticing something about myself that's holding me back or that's causing, you know, challenges that really is, is, is something I control and it's related to me specifically, not the market, not other people, not the circumstance, not luck is related to my behavior and how I think about things or how I feel about things. And I wish, and I always encourage people to do is learn how to identify those things in yourself and correct them as quickly as possible, as often as possible. And if you increase that feedback, uh, that feedback loop on self-improvement, I think you, you know, the sky's the limit. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, excellent. Excellent point. Uh, you know, continued growth, intentional growth, uh, very critical. And uh, I think it definitely does uh, contribute to living an extraordinary life because a lot of people just don't want to put themselves through that, frankly, right? They don't want to acknowledge those things, let alone do anything about it. Yeah. So very good advice. All right. Well, and then last but not least, Jacob, if folks want to get in touch with you, how can they find you? Yeah. Our website's probably the best place. Uh, that's just renjoy.com, R-E-N-J-O-Y.com. And uh, if you fill out anything on that website and uh, you mention my name, it'll probably get to me. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much for sharing great advice, uh, interesting insights, interesting story, uh, and your white spot. Very cool. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. And for those of you that joined us today, thank you for investing your time with us. Don't forget to like, rate, and review the show. Let us know more that you want to hear about. And in the meantime, be bold, be extraordinary, and keep moving forward.